I'm Dr. Daniel Cantor, Neurology in Real Time. I'm joined here by actual people with multiple sclerosis. We're here at the Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Center's annual meeting in Seattle, and instead of it just being the scientists, yes. the doctors, the nurses, the physical, occupational, speech therapists, people from nonprofits, there are people who actually have multiple sclerosis and have multiple ties like that. They may be involved with nonprofits, may be involved in other kinds of things, and they're actually here at the conference. So I'm joined here by Laura and by Jerry. Thank you so much for joining me. Can I ask you a question? As a person living with multiple sclerosis but very involved in what goes on, why is it beneficial to come to a meeting such as this one? Well, it's beneficial in two ways. One, it's beneficial to me that I get to learn and make new connections within the industry and to hear about the latest um, latest approaches to doing rehab and therapy and taking care of the individual with multiple sclerosis. But even more important, I think it is, is that the people who are here, especially from the industry side, are getting exposure to a person with multiple sclerosis who can come in and give you real-time, first-hand experience because you all may be the expert Dr. Cantor, but Jerry and I are the real MS experts. Absolutely, the real experts. Now, Jerry, when you first got diagnosed, there was no expertise. You went online, there wasn't online. You had to go to the library, get those uh, Dewey Decimal cards and try to figure out what's going on. So tell me, how have things changed in the last decade, two decades, in terms of information? Because people back home don't have to actually be here. They watch our videos. There's now 250,000 viewers. We're now going to start wow. translating into Spanish and into other languages to make wow. sure that we can spread this really throughout the world. What have you noticed has been the difference in the way technology is helped all of us educate better well there's everything from apps to you know to help us um, learn up learn about and manage our condition um, to just so much more information out there I mean any way that you can digest it whether it's from YouTube or blogs or articles um, or in the support groups it's everywhere where it didn't used to be so it's no question that having more information is better. But let's look at the other side. Let's say, what could we do better? Looking at a conference such as this one, where do you think the gaps still are in MS? What is the next big thing that we should be thinking about? Whether it's research, whether it's symptom management, what is the next big thing? If you want to say three things that we should be doing better in MS, what are they? There are two four-letter words I'd like to use here. The first is hope. We need to give people hope that there's something on the horizon that looks at a cure for multiple sclerosis. So that's my second four-letter word. We're still hope, we have hope for a cure, and I don't see any conversation here about a cure. Um, and I know there's bench science going on that's looking at the cause of multiple sclerosis and how we can stop it today and tomorrow and the next day that other people aren't going to have this condition that Jerry and I have, but we don't hear any conversation about that now for a variety of reasons, uh, proprietary mainly, mm -hmm. and the industry doesn't want to share what they're doing. But it's really important, I think, that we talk hope and cure. Jerry, what do you think? Well, I totally agree. Um, I also think that we need to be, I mean, you hear a lot of talk about patient centricity and working together with um, uh, patients and decision making. Um, but I'm looking around this conference and it's almost like they don't expect a patient to be here. It's very anti-patient. It's, I mean, it's not um, just the matter of taking several elevators to get up here. Uh, and the, the walking on different surfaces. Um, I haven't been able to even walk around. To, my hotel is two blocks away, but it's uphill, downhill. Uh, it's all, um, it's just not, a, not real patient friendly. I'm looking around to see a place to sit down right now, and, and it's a long walk to get there. Mm -hmm. Those are really excellent points that hopefully the organizers listen to. Uh, several years ago, we did a videos. We did our videos at Actrum, so the America's Committee on Treatment and Research in MS, and we did them as a consortium. And we were there in New Orleans. You guys may have been there, there. in New Orleans. And, and so at Actrum's. We did a couple first. One of them is I did, I think, 32 videos in one day. 
And the other first was that a person with multiple sclerosis was following Twitter, following us on LinkedIn. It wasn't Instagram at the time, but there was Facebook. And she actually drove into New Orleans, her husband drove, and she came with her power chair and came to ask me questions. And then what I did is I said to the organizers, can she come in? This is just the end of the meeting. She doesn't have to pay the exorbitant prices for these meetings. Can she just come in? They weren't sure. And I said, listen, she'll come in as part of my press. Let her in and let her just see the end. And you know what it turned out? She has 10,000 followers for her amazing blog about progressive multiple sclerosis. So a little goodwill went a long way, I think, for the organization. So that patient centricity and not just giving lip service to the idea of patient centricity, but seeing actual patient centricity. I would love to see on these panels, you have a doctor there, you have a nurse there, you have a therapist. On every single panel, I would love to see a person or a care partner living with multiple sclerosis. Laura and Jerry, I want to thank you guys so much. And I want to thank all of you back home for watching us at Real Time Neurology.